Salad family. It's lovely to see you all. So uh, we'll be approaching our divine service, but before that we'll have a few announcements. So uh, uh, just to let you know that the announcements are all here in our church bulletin for those who have none. So uh, let me have the honor to uh, inform you. So our, our prayer meeting is happening every Wednesday. But it has been agreed that uh, every last Wednesday of the month, the church is open, and it has been start. It has started for two to three weeks already. Uh, we, we we come here to join uh, in worshiping God in this church every last Sabbath of the mo- every last Wednesday of the month. Okay, so and with that, uh, it's also open to Zoom. So you have the details uh, with the passcode for the Zoom. And then reminding uh, that uh, everyone about the IM Youth Sports Day on July 2nd uh, in Gormanston Park, Country Myth, okay? So that's for, uh, uh, you, have, you have to pay five pounds for 10 to 30 years old, okay? Ask Filani, Brother Filani and Brother Kevin uh, if you want to take part. Then uh, on the 8th of July, which is very soon, uh, we will have our guest here, our speaker, Pastor Sean Bonstra. So uh, that's on July 8th. Then um, on August 9 to 15, we have our IM uh, summer camp for 9 to 17 years old, okay? So uh, uh, those who would like to attend, please uh, approach uh, uh, Caroline with this one. Then uh, we have a baptismal class ongoing every Sabbath. Uh, that's uh, during the Sabbath school. So if you like to uh, attend or uh, be uh, participate in Bible's deeper Bible study uh, for for in-depth uh, knowledge, so you like you can join here at the uh, vestry. Uh, that's that's uh, during the Sabbath school every Sabbath. So and then uh, about we have an ongoing uh, an app in progress uh, seven M E or seven Me. So that's, uh, the, that's through Brother Patrick and Kevin. So they will give us more updates. So uh, uh, last Sabbath, uh, I've, uh, we've read with uh, our uh, Sabbath, I mean, church text uh, in WhatsApp that there's a bit of concern about the noise. So uh, I think it is wise for us to be reminded all the time that uh, Sabbath is uh, we approach God, our maker, if we give much respect to, if we're, if we're interviewed, so this is our God, so we have to approach the church with much respect and uh, our reverend. So, uh, so with this, let us bring back the practice of staying quiet while you're inside the church. And uh, there are parents who are concerned about their kids. So uh, it is also uh, our encouragement that parents we keep an eye on our kids. We let them know that uh, every Sabbath they should be on, beside us, especially during divine service after the Sabbath school, so that it will be uh, a practice for them that, you know, in divine service we are as a family inside the church worshiping our God. But with this, the children's ministry or department of our church is uh, they have our children in their mind, okay? So with this, we, we, we would like to ask volunteers, teachers, who would support the Sabbath School Department. So who, if you like to volunteer to help us, please approach me, approach uh, Rosie, approach Princess, and approach Caroline, either four of us, if you like to volunteer to help us. Because we'll be looking like twice or once a month, we'll be having our divine service for the young children, or I mean young people or children in a di- different room. So that's a plan in progress. So those who love to volunteer to help us, please uh, approach uh, uh, any of us. Uh, Caroline, as I mentioned, we have Rosie, Princess, and myself. Is that okay? So uh, let us uh, prepare ourselves for our main uh, divine service. Thank you. Again, welcome everyone to our church and to our divine service. To those who are in line, in line we welcome you too for, and we thank you for uh, worshiping God with us today, the Sabbath day. So uh, 
We like to thank that uh, the Lord that He has brought Pastor Dan here with us. So our program will go go on as uh, printed here, and uh, we'll have a prayer and uh, and a quick ordination for one of our elders here uh, before the uh, sermonate. Okay, to to set our minds. For our, uh, for our worship today, I'd like to invite you to open your book, your Bible, to the book of Psalms, chapter 67. Psalms, chapter 67, 1 to 7. So, let, to, to help us, let us, uh, I'll read the first, then you, you do the second verse, the reading, then alternately. And then in the verse 7, We'll read it all together and we'll say amen. Is that okay? Okay, Psalms 67, 1 to 6, 1 to 7. God, be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine out upon us, Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. God bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty Father, our God in heaven, the creator of all things, and, the, and who controls all things, we come before thee, Father, with humble hearts and bowed heads, asking thee, Father, to forgive us of all uncleanliness, of all the sins that we've done during the past few hours. Father, at this very moment, we ask thee that may you make us worthy to be able to accept your blessing today. We ask thy forgiveness. We ask for your love and for your tender mercies. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are opening our program today with the hymn number 304, Faith of Our Fathers. I invite the congregation to stand up to sing together this hymn. <laughs>
in Croatia, learned to play the violin, his second love, long before he went to school. But it is at school that Joshua exercises his first love, which is sharing God with his friends. They were not interested when he tried to tell them stories about Jesus. But when Joshua invited them to a vacation Bible school, some of his friends attended and liked it so much that they wanted to go again. One girl, Mela, was so impressed that she told Joshua, it's a miracle, there really is a God. Joshua gave Mela a Bible, and now Mela and her mother attend Joshua's church. Mela has joined Pathfinders, and her mother goes to a woman's group at the church. One day Joshua heard about a boy, very sick with a brain tumor. His family couldn't afford to pay for the operation that he needed. Joshua thought for a while, and then said, I know, we can have a concert to raise money to help this boy. Okay, his mother said, but who will organize it? I will, said Joshua. After sharing his idea at the school, 15 young musicians agreed to play in the concert. Joshua talked with the pastor, who opened the local Adventist church for the concert. Soon, posters were posted all over town, inviting people to the special fundraising program. About 300 people attended the concert, most of whom had never been to an Adventist church. Joshua and his friends were delighted to learn that their concert raised 8,600 Croatian kunas, about 1,300 US dollars. That's more than an average person in Croatia earns in a month. Who knew that a boy and his violin can make such an impact on God? Each of us is called to be a missionary like Joshua, using all God-given talents influence, and resources to forward his kingdom on this earth. Today, offer yourself to God besides your tithe and promise offering, which is your regular and systematic offering. May we put our desires last and God first. Before I read a Bible text for our scripture, up for our Bible, I mean, for, I mean tithes and offerings, I'd like to ask everyone to pray special for Sister Celia and Sister Joyce. I've heard that Sister Celia is not very well, so let us keep her in our mind. So uh, for, our, for our offering in tithes, let us open our Bible to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. I read, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Amen. Our deacons are ready to serve us our offerings and tithes. Amen. Let us pray. Our kind, generous Father in heaven, we give praise and we give thanks to your name for that was supplied all the things that we need in our lives. I'd like to thank you, Father, for that has not only given us the resources to feed ourselves, to have shelter and clothing, but most of all, you have given us good health in the family around us. Father, we're always grateful and we are thankful always. We offer these tithes and offerings to you 
and somehow it will help to furtherance uh, for your cause. Bless those who have given and bless who were not able to give today. And somehow in the near future, they will be able to give back to what belongs to you. For all this we pray, through the loving, mighty name of Jesus, your Son and Savior. Amen. Happy Sabbath. The scripture reading today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, from verse 22 to 26. And it reads, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on him. He asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and he made him look up and he was restored and saw everything clearly. Then he, he sent him away to his house saying, neither go to the t into the town nor tell anyone in the town. May God bless his word. time for our prayer now and I'll invite the congregation to kneel or to bow as feel appropriate. Our Father which are in heaven, we come Lord to your presence to give you thanks that we can come to church to worship you. We thank you for the many blessings you give us and we thank you that you are our Father and you are our Savior. We are remembering now in our prayer the people which couldn't come to church today for different reasons. Please bless them and be with them in the places where they are. We also would like to bring before you in a special way uh, our members which are not well, and especially Celia which is in hospital at the minute. We are asking for your healing um, and we are asking for your blessings upon her and her family. We are also bringing before you Joyce, which she was in hospital, but she's recovering now. We are also asking for the other peoples which are not well and we don't know them by name. We are asking for a blessing for each one which gather here today to worship you. We ask for blessings for the speaker today and ask that we will get blessed by the word which we will get. And also we are asking for your Holy Spirit to be poured upon us so we not only understand your word, but to live your word. All these things we ask in your name. Amen. Before our... Before our sermon, uh, we have a congregational song, so we can uh, be seated and sing the servant song.
What a beautiful song. Actually, I've never heard it before. A beautiful message. It's a sermon on its own. Um, I'm very happy. We're very happy to be here with you this, uh, this morning today and uh, to be able to share together in such a special service. Uh, <clears throat> I understand Pastor Adam was here last Sabbath. Um, we haven't spoken about this, so I'm not really sure whether he shared anything with you about what's happening as far as the search for a new pastor is concerned. Um, all I'm going to say um, is thank you for your patience. And we continue to need your prayers. We've been very hard at work. And um, we believe that the Lord has a plan for this church. God has a plan for the person that he has chosen to be brought here, just that we have not yet found that person. So we continue to need your patience. We appreciate your patience and we need your prayers. We uh, have been in direct contact with a number of individuals. Um, at the moment, we are looking across the BUC because we realize that inviting people from further afield, it takes a very long time. I don't know if you remember, but we shared the great news with uh, um, the uh, offer of employment for a pastor for the Dublin area, Dublin West. Um, from Trinidad, we are still waiting for the visa to be processed. It takes a very long time. So we're trying to find uh, a good but quicker solution. I would like to uh, thank the leadership of the church for their work that they've done thus far. And I know that you are a congregation that can continue, but at the same time, we do not take that for granted. So uh, I thought I'll just let you know. And I was speaking about, uh, about servitude and speaking about leadership. Uh, before we proceed with our sermon, we have another very special service. Uh, as you know, a number of months ago, uh, three new elders were appointed um, as leaders within the Belfast Church, and two of them are ordained, and one is not. And when we had the Dale Fellowship, the plan was then to actually for Elder, and I'm going to say your name correctly this time, all right? Eugen. Can you do that? Eugen. I know, it's still going to be Eugene. <laughs> um, he, he was supposed to be ordained. Unfortunately, the program was very, very busy, and we didn't get around with it, but, uh, to it. So um, right now, before we proceed with the sermon and the communion service, uh, I'm just going to have a, a short reading from the scriptures, and then I'm going to invite all the ordained elders to join me on the platform, and we will have a prayer of ordination for Elder Eugen. Acts chapter 14, and uh, speaking about Paul and Barnabas at Lystra, uh, in verse 23 we read, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And I like to see in the bulletin here in your program, right at the back, and it says pastoral matters, um, and then you've got the elder, elder's contact details. Uh, when it comes to service within the church, I always refer to the eldership as the pastoral team. Okay, the church does not just have one pastor. There is a team of shepherds set aside by God to serve the church. And uh, it is a privilege to be able to share the ministry with people who have committed their lives to service as volunteers, unpaid volunteers, doing it out of, you know, uh, a very deep conviction that God has brought them in the, into this role. So uh, I understand Sister Elder Eileen is the only other elder who is present here. And, oh, and, and Pilani, yeah, Elder Pilani, please, if you don't mind to just join me on the platform, we are going to kneel together. You may remain seated. Elder Pilani, I, I didn't see you. I was looking somewhere else. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have a prayer of consecration and ordination for uh, Elder Eugene. Thank you. 
Okay. Let me get back in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that you grant us to be part of your church as believers and also in various capacities to serve your church. And we know, Lord, that uh, Brother Eugene has um, helped the church and served the church in different, different roles. And now you have called him to be an elder in this Belfast church. Lord, we do not take such things lightly. We acknowledge that this is your business and that we need to dedicate ourselves to you daily and also receive the blessing of your Holy Spirit to serve, to serve in this capacity. Today, with humility, as servants of yours, we bring before you, brother, and elder Eugene. We entrust him into your care. And we pray, Lord, in, in everything, you will grant him wisdom, you will grant him patience, and love towards the church. May his witness be one that brings people closer to you. May he be an example in his family, at work, wherever he may find himself. And led by your Holy Spirit, may he represent your character amongst your church. We thank you, Lord, for the calling that you've placed on his heart. And knowing, Lord, that you are blessing and you have blessed him for this role, we thank you. We thank you for the rest of the team. And we continue to pray, Lord, that you will bring here a pastor that you have called to serve the Belfast Church and the Belfast community. And that together, Lord, together we will do all we can under your guidance to prepare ourselves and to help others prepare for your soon return. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for Elder Eugene and his family. And we thank you for the calling that you've placed on his heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I remember not long ago um, when we came to, to Belfast Church, I tried to sit as close to the heaters as I could. Things have changed. <laughs> uh, we thank God for the good weather, and it is our prayer that uh, the sunshine that is outside will also find its way in our lives and in our hearts. For today, for the, for the communion service, there's just a, I, I was told as we're preparing that we're going to have the, dedicate, the, the ordination uh, prayer before the sermonette. You know what that means, right? That's a very kind and tactful way of telling the preacher, don't preach too long. Right? So for our sermonette today, I'd like to once again direct your attention to Mark chapter 8. Our scripture reading, Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. And uh, I've been thinking about what we were, you know, what would be good to share for, for the service, because every time when we come to a communion service, this is a very special program. It's a very special time whereby we allow the Holy Spirit or we invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us in a way that not just makes sense, but a way that builds us up, that affirms the faith that we have in Christ. And uh, this week we had a pastoral team meeting and we invited a lay person to present his ideas on what evangelism to our children and youth should be all about. And I think that many of you know him I'm talking about uh, Peter uh, Popinavov, I think I'm saying the, right, the, the name right, is the Irish Mission um, Children's Ministry sponsor. And I, he, he started with a slide of people walking in a city, but they were walking so fast that the picture was very blurry. 
and he made reference to this verse where it speaks about people looking like walking trees. And it made me think. It made me think. So let's go back to, to the passage, and then we're going to focus on just the last part of Mark 8, uh, verses 22 to 26. Um, I'm going to read the passage again. It's from, I read from the English Standard Version, and they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. Do not even enter the village. Now, there are a few things about this passage that I'm sure you've heard. Um, you've read it before. Maybe you've heard sermons on this before. Um, reflecting on it, there are two main ideas or two things that really popped out for me. First of all, God spoke the world, the universe, into existence. Right? That's what we read in the Scriptures. God, Jesus, spoke everything that exists into existence. But here, he needs to spit, touch, and then touch again to heal this blind man. Did Jesus have a bad day? What happened? Why is it that he had to do a do-over? Wouldn't you expect that, I mean, the people brought the blind man to him, and they said if he could only touch him, he would be healed. And Jesus spits, touches his eyes, the man opens his eyes, and as he opens his eyes, he can see, but not very clearly. And the best way he can describe is like, listen, the trees on the side of the road and people kind of like mingle. It's very confusing. Everybody looks like walking trees. Put yourself in that man's position. All right, I'm sure he heard of Jesus. I'm sure he was really excited about meeting Jesus. He was a, a little bit nervous about it. You know, is he going to pay attention to me? And then... He's taken by the hand by Jesus. And I'm sure in his mind, he, there, there, there was a party in his heart. He couldn't wait. Then he feels something wet on his eyes. Probably he heard the sound. It's like, what's going on? And then he feels a touch. And then, yeah, okay, let me open my eyes. And he, as he opens his eyes, he can't see well. There must have been a little bit of confusion, a little bit of disappointment, a little bit of what's going on, what's wrong with him, what's wrong with me. And then Jesus asks him a question. Can you see? And then Jesus touches him again. And then he opens his eyes. And now he can see clearly. 2020 vision. He must have been so excited. People around them just murmuring. But just if, if you, if we, as we read the passage, Jesus seemingly took him a little bit away from the crowd. But what's even more interesting, we are going to come back to one of the possible interpretations of why Jesus, it took two attempts for Jesus to perform this miracle. What really strikes me even more is what Jesus says to him. And I think, again, this blind man, I mean, the healed man, now he's not, you see, uh, when th this is just a beautiful nugget. When, we when you encounter Jesus, you are not going to be known as you've been known before. Now, this is not the blind man anymore because he wasn't blind. He is the healed man. And now he, he looks at him and he can see Jesus clearly, and Jesus says to him, listen, 
I don't want you to go into, into the village. I want you to go back home now. But Jesus, everybody knows. You know, there was a lot of things that people were saying. And they could see that I was blind. I have friends. They know me. And I'm so excited to go and let them know. No, I want you to go turn around and go home. We're not going to make a big deal about this healing of yours. Why is it that Jesus gave him this advice? If you look throughout the scriptures, wherever Jesus performs a miracle, he does this. There are very few instances, if we can remember, you know, the, um, the pigs, the demons that go into the pigs, that then, you know, he, he, he tells to the people, you know, you can go and share. But usually he doesn't want those who have been touched and healed by him to go and tell people. He even told them, go and tell no one. All right, or go to the temple. Give thanks to God. Why is it that Jesus told him to go back home and not share the good news with anybody? I'm going to give you three answers, and we're going to try and, as I said, make sense of it. And maybe, friends, today we're going to hear something that may not be as, um, as nice. You'll see what I mean. But at the same time, we're going to come to the point of why it is so important to have this commemoration, this remembrance, and to partake of the Holy Communion. All right. Uh, the first answer I'd like to suggest to you is that Jesus did not consider healing and exorcism his primary mission. He didn't come to earth to impress anybody. He didn't come to earth, and this is where the shocking part may come in, to alleviate poverty, to heal everybody. The Bible says that there were villages that he passed through. And once he was done, there would be no more sick people. He performed miracles, but that was not his primary objective or his primary mission. Jesus felt no pressure to impress, and he had no need to prove himself to anyone that he is God, especially by performing miracles. Within Christendom, in certain, in certain circles, there's an overemphasis on healing. And interestingly enough, very often that goes together with appeals for money. The more you give, the more God is going to do for you. The emphasis in Jesus' ministry has never been... He didn't mean it to be on the healing part. Um, there's a book written in the 19th century uh, by Henry David uh, Thoreau, who spent about, I don't know, two years or so uh, by a lake, and he just realized the beauty of nature and how even in the 19th century... Uh, you know, uh, technology and things are just taking us away from that. And uh, the, the, the lake was called Walden Pond. Uh, it mustn't be too, too big if it was a, called a pond. And the, bo the book he wrote was entitled, uh, entitled very simply uh, Walden. And uh, in it, as I said, he described the beauty of nature. But in that book, he wrote a phrase, just two words, that has become, you know, I think quite a number of people use them today. He repeated the word, simplify. Simplify. Right? Sometimes people want to be cool when, when they greet one another and they just kind of say, simplify. And it's something that's kind of like stuck. I don't know if we really, I don't know if you've heard this expression before. But there's a brilliant message in it. Jesus, when he came to this earth, 
his mission was very, very simple. And unfortunately, at times, we tend to complicate things to an extent that we do not see the essence. There's too much debris around it. And we focus on things that Jesus ne never wanted or wants us to focus on. I'm coming now to point number two. And I remember, you know, at times I would start a sermon with a question, are you in need of a miracle? And preaching-wise, it sounds good, doesn't it? It's a good introduction. And the truth is that maybe some of us here today, yes, we are in need of something totally out of this world for God to step in in a way that cannot be explained by human means and to do something that only God can do. And you know what? That's his prerogative. Maybe some of us here today will leave the church with God having performed a miracle in our lives, in our circumstances, that will be revealed today or in a week or in a month's time. Because God does care. But maybe sometimes we are so obsessed and preoccupied with the problem and a solution to our immediate problem that we minimize God and we see him just within the context of our daily encounters, difficult situations, and God is the one who steps in and resolves all our problems. Please, let us be honest. Let us be honest. Have you ever prayed for a, uh, for, for a situation, a difficult situation, and you had the belief that God would step in and, you know, perform a miracle, and let's say something happened that was out of the ordinary, and you're like, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Why? Why did we praise God in such situations? For what we perceived that he's done. Not because of who he is or what God is all about. It was more about us than about him. And were there situations when we asked God and we believed and things didn't happen the way we expected them to happen and then we're disappointed and angry and maybe even somehow, what's God doing? Why isn't he doing this? Because we tend to minimize him, to bring him down to our level. Now, one of the reasons why I believe, so this is the one that I'm, I want to focus on, and by the way, uh, the title of the sermon is Equipped to Enter the Village. One of the reasons why Jesus sent this man back home was because Jesus did not want him to give the wrong message. I read this sentence just a few days ago. Jesus is more interested in teaching us spiritual truths and in sanctifying our hearts than in making our lives easier. Why do we come to church? Because we want answers. Because we want solutions. Because we want to feel better. Could it be that very often our worship has nothing to do with God, but our expectations of Him? Could it be that sometimes we come to God so that we can indebt Him to us? As a child, I remember, you know, I didn't grow up with a lot, materially speaking. I grew up with a lot as far as love and care and a great family is concerned. But sometimes I, I, I still remember, I still remember telling my dad, you know, I really want that toy. Dad, I really, really want that toy. And for whatever reason, he'll say, Dan, we can't afford it or, you know, you are not going to get it. Or, and I remember so many times saying, but, but I'm a good boy, Dad. That, that was my, you know, I'm a good boy. In other words, I deserve it. I don't care you don't have money. I deserve it. Could it be that at times 
That's exactly what happens when we come to worship God. And I don't think that Jesus had a bad day that day. Jesus is Jesus. Jesus is God. He, could, he healed people from a distance. He didn't even have to be present. But this time he takes extra time. He even uses, you know, material, that you know, teachable material, if you want, some spit. In other instances, you would mix it with, with sand, make some, some mud, and put it on people's eyes. So he uses extra measures for the healing to demonstrate that this man was not yet ready to see. That he wasn't able to see Jesus for who he was. And even after Jesus heals him physically, he tells him, you know what, I need you to go home. I don't want you to speak about this. Because the message you have may not necessarily be the message I want you to preach. Friends, let's just pause here. And I know it's a sermonette, but this is a longer sermonette than expected. Um, I think that when we come to this table, it is very important that we really press pause and try and reflect, not just where am I at in my relationship with God, but where am I at in my understanding of who God is? We speak a lot about preaching the message. And Elder Eileen, I, I did sense that you know, you, you, you're sharing the, the lesson. Those are amazing teachings, but they are not easy teachings to, to explain. They are not easy teachings to understand. But I would like to suggest to you that the, the, the gospel message... The three angels' messages encompasses the gospel message, but the gospel message is greater than just revelation. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. And certain teachings, will never, people will never be able to understand them unless they understand the basics. And I'd like to suggest to you that as a church, we need to come back to a point where we need to simplify. Simplify. Last point, point. The man was not ready. So the reason why Jesus told him to go home, the man was not ready. He was not equipped yet to enter the village because the focus of his witnessing would have been misplaced. I read about the Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger effect is when people who are just beginning to understand the new concept have an overinflated confidence in their understanding. And I've seen that people who study, the more they study, the more they come to understand how little they know. Sometimes we know certain things or we think we know certain things about the truth that we are called to preach. And probably our confidence is greater than our knowledge. And maybe our knowledge is greater than our anointing. We don't really talk about that, do we? Again, this is not, I'm, I'm not trying to bash anybody. This is a message I want to take to the churches as I travel. But this is the time where we really need to pause and think. Are we ready and are we equipped to go into the village? Because sometimes if our focus is miscued, if we just see people as walking trees, how much do we really care about the community we're part of? We're talking yesterday, visiting some friends, we're talking about the impact of cell phones on, on you know, our children, on people. I remember growing up and waiting for buses and being in a bus station, and I wouldn't mind it because, you know, you'd make friends there. You'd talk to people. Look at the, at the bus station today. Everybody's in their world. <laughs> Actually in a different world, in a virtual world. It's almost as if we don't know how to talk to one another. I saw an advert for a seminar on how to speak to strangers. 
simplify. But now, can we see the people out there for what they are? If we sometimes, even within the church, our brothers and sisters, we see them like walking trees, like in a blur. We say happy Sabbath on the Sabbath, but that's about it. I love that initiative of putting on the screen, you know, the pictures and the names and a little bit of information about the people who attend this church. You get to know them a little bit. In Cape Town, I had a church that was about 500 members. There were lots of students, and honestly, I would go on the street and people would say, Hello, Pastor, how are you? And I would have no idea who they were. Hello, you. <laughs> So we actually made a big table with pictures and names. And there's people who come into the church to get to know people. For a few Sabbaths, people had, especially, you know, as students, they would just, uh, you know, uh, start university, uh, name tags. Just to get to know people a little bit. Another reason why we may not be ready, equipped. Let me tell you about lions, mice, and antelopes. A lion can capture, kill, and eat a field mouse. There's no problem with that. However, it turns out that the energy to do that is greater than the amount of calories a mouse provides. The chase. I don't know if you've ever chased a mouse in the house. So if a lion spent his whole day hunting and eating field mice, it would slowly starve itself to death. A lion cannot live on mice. A lion needs antelopes. Antelopes are big. Simplify, okay? While they take more speed and strength to capture and kill, once killed, they provide a huge feast for the lion and its pride. A lion can live a long and happy life on a diet of antelope. It will die chasing mice. If we are spending all of our time and energy going after field mice, our short-term reward is a feeling of activity and maybe even accomplishment. However, in the long run, we're going to die. Could it be that sometimes we major in minors? Could it be that sometimes we spend so much time and energy on things that Jesus sometimes, when he looks at what's going on, feels like saying, you know what, go back home. You're not ready. Again, this is the time when we need to draw the line and think to ourselves, what am I focusing on? What am I spending my time and energy? And as church leaders... What are we focusing on? What do we spend our time and energy on? One last idea and I'll close. I have a very good friend who uh, is not an Adventist, amazing guy. And he was sharing some coping mechanisms on how to deal with anger. So he said, he's been married for a while. He said, whenever I have a disagreement with my wife, I don't want, I need space. I don't want to speak right then because I know I'll hurt her. And I'll say things I can't take back. So he said, I go for a long walk. I take my pipe. I smoke my pipe. I calm down. And then I can go back home. And we can have a decent conversation. Stay with me. I'm not uh, preaching smoking pipes. Another example says, I get very impatient in traffic. I said amen to that when he told me. I do the same. He said, yes, some, someone cuts in front of me. I get very angry. But he said, I have preset on my radio in the car a station for classical music. He says, I don't usually listen to classical music. But if someone upsets me in traffic, I just press that button and that music calms me down. And then all the bad thoughts and words that I've said and I thought, 
just dissipate, and I'm okay. I thought to myself, what is the difference as far as behavior and controlling negative behavior is concerned between him and a Christian? When he gets upset with his wife, he goes for a walk and smokes a pipe. As a Christian, I may also go for a walk, but say a prayer, right? God, help me to deal with this. If someone makes you angry, if someone makes him angry, he listens to classical music. What do we usually do? God, please help me. Give me the patience to deal with this person. Right? Now, what is the difference? Because in the end, it seems that both of us manage to control negative behavior. And as far as we are concerned, we are good witnesses. As far as he is concerned, he's a decent citizen. What is the difference? Why bring God and religion into the picture? Because, friends, this is what we usually do. We minimize God. We oversimplify the behavior. God helps me to be more patient. God helps me to do this. God helps me to do that. Do you know why Jesus came and died for us? Not so that we can behave better. What does the Bible say? That's a byproduct. Don't get me wrong. But the Bible says that he came to die so that we could live forever. You know what the difference is? When he does what he does, he's aware that he's made a mistake. When I do what I do that's negative, I'm aware that I have sinned, not just made a mistake. And the only difference is the understanding that there is such a thing in this world that is called sin. And that nobody, nobody could resolve the problem called sin but Jesus. As we partake of these symbols, friends, we are not partaking of these symbols just so that we ask God to help us to be better. Ellen White says that we shouldn't ask to be better, we should ask to be transformed. Amen? Amen? But as we approach this table, we need to understand the reality of sin that doesn't just, doesn't just <clears throat> mess us up in our interactions, but it separates us from a creator, loving, eternal God who wants us to be with him for eternity. As we approach this, God takes care of of the problem called sin. We are justified and sanctified and therefore saved for eternity. Amen? Amen. It is my prayer that our focus in our relationship with God will be one whereby we understand the magnitude of what sin has done and can do but also understand the greatness of God as we simplify matters and allow him to be the great God that he is in our small little lives so that one day we don't just get to understand a little bit more of who he is, but be witnesses that brings people to a God who saves rather than to an ideology that makes people barely better. Amen? Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to have a short prayer, and then we're going to have um, the ordinance of humility. It is a beautiful, beautiful uh, thing that we do as Seventh-day Adventists. In some churches, it is used just the priests do the foot washing. This is open, by the way, communion is open to everyone who calls Jesus their Lord and Savior. You don't even have to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as long as you understand what communion stands for. We're not going to take it lightly. This symbolizes the broken body of Jesus Christ on the cross. And this unfermented wine, this, this uh, grape juice, symbolizes 
Jesus' blood that was shed for our salvation. So we don't take it lightly, but it is an open invitation. And before we do that, we have the ceremony of the foot washing, whereby we are washed anew. It is like a mini baptism, but also whereby we acknowledge that we are all equal before God. As we kneel in front of each other from different cultures, different uh, 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 you know, walks of life, we are all the same. Sinners in need of grace. All right? And as we wash each other's feet, we invite Christ to be the great one in our lives. So let's just have a prayer. And then if the deacons can help me, I've never done it here before. Where do the women go? Where do the men go? So the ladies, our sisters will go into the uh, youth hall and the men in the vestry here. Let's, uh, let, let's just have a prayer together and then we'll separate for the foot washing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for, first of all, for our presence here. There is no accident that every single one of us, you've directed our steps to this place. Lord, we acknowledge that we are in the very presence of God. We need a moment to really understand what that means. The God who created the universe. We don't even know what we say when we say that. The very same God through the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe through the Holy Spirit. God, you are here with us. And in this moment, we're coming together to remember how serious sin coming into this world, how serious the problem of sin really is. That you had to become one of us, take upon yourself all the guilt and shame and consequences of sin, and die on the cross so that we may never die the second death. This is the message. This is not about us being a bit better than other people. This is not even about our, our current circumstances and situations, even though we know that you care and we know that you love us and we know that you step in. But this is about acknowledging that you desire to take sin away so that we cannot be separated from you when you'll come again and you want us to be with you forever. Lord, we pray that you will uh, give us a humble spirit, a true understanding as we wash each other's feet. You've left, left this as an example for us. Help us, Lord, to understand how great you are and how great our need of you really is. And we pray, Lord, that through confession you will remove all sin from our lives so that we can be justified before you and the entire universe. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at... Oh, we'll see in a minute. Shh, no blocks. <laughs> right, come and sit down. Children, would you like to come over over here so we can all see in here? Right, Sam, come over this way. I just want you to stay away from the communion table. Right. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, children. How are you all? All good? Let me see the smiles. Who's happy today? Yes, good week, bad week, Midland. Oh, who had a bad week? What? What happened? Oh, Leaver's Day. You, you had a good week. Yes, he's all excited to be finished school. Who's excited to be finished school for the summer? Yes, it's all very exciting, isn't it? But you'll miss your friend. Who'll miss the homework? Oh, a few of you. What's your favorite, favorite thing about school? Oh, yes. Hanging out with your friends, doing fun stuff. Yes, what's your favorite thing about school? Th what? 
Or painting. Who likes a painting? Yes. What's your favourite thing about school? Snack. Snack. Yes, David, what's your favourite? Sports. That's a good answer too, isn't it? Yes, Sophia? Oh, after lunch, you go outside and play. Yes, Maya? Oh, are you going into P7? Not yet, but that's what you're going to look forward to. Yes, anybody? Oh, lots of, yes, David? Learning. Learning. Very good. Yes, Latabo? Oh, trip week. You like to get away on special trips. And what about you? Playing. Who likes to work? Yes, Skylar, have you got something favourite about school? No? No, nothing. Yes, Eddie? My, are you going to close the door? Even? Pardon? Oh, taster days. That sounds interesting. Who likes to play in a team sport? Me. What sort of team sports do you do in school? Who plays? Yes. Beach ball. Bench ball. Oh, bench ball. I've not heard of that one. That's a good one. Yes. Racing. Have you ever ra- run a relay race? Yeah. yeah. You ran it on sports day? And how does a relay race work? Yeah, you tell us, David, about your relay race. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So you have to run a bit. You hand the stick over and the next person runs a bit and they hand the stick over and the next... And like we had a good story about a relay race not long ago when Patrick was telling the story, didn't we? And what other team sports? Yes, David. Football. Now, does football... How does, how does the football work in a team? Do you have to all have different positions on the field, don't you? And then you have to... Somebody, somebody will be at defence and somebody will be in attack and somebody will be in goals and somebody... Yes? Oh, in basketball. Oh, in basketball. Same with basketball. You'll have different people playing different roles. Yes? Tug of war. I was thinking of tug of war as well. Tug of war, we need a team. Would tug of war work really well if you had a big team on one side and a small team on the other? No, we need a bit of a balance, don't we? Yes, Vasiti. Volleyball. Who plays volleyball? Very good. So, you, again, you have your six people in a team, and they all have a different place to sit, and they all have to work together to get the ball over the net and slam dunk it down so it gets a point. Right, I want to show you something in my bag. And it's not so much about being a team, but it's how do we make things. So, when a team is playing together, They're working on a strategy. They're working on how to play the game, how they can help each other, win the points or win the game. Yes? You like painting. Painting's really cool. I've got something in here I want to show you. Who likes to work with this? It's not very exciting, I know, like volleyball or... So what is it? Yeah, you can call it yarn or wool. I call it wool, but most people call it yarn, right? Who likes this color and this color? And what sort of things could you do with that? Like you could try and juggle with it. I don't think you could play volleyball with it. You could play catch with it. Here, catch. Yes, now throw it back. Yeah, oh, oh, not very good at catching. Oh, that's better. Could you play football with it? Not really. You could knit clothes, but how do you knit clothes with just wool? What else would I need? You would need something to put it together, wouldn't you? So if I put them down there, and if I show you something else, now Latabo knows what this is. No, don't touch me a second. Sit back so everybody can see. If I pull something else out of my little bag here, <gasps> what's this? It's a, what is it, Latabo? Yeah, it's a crochet hook. Now what, if I stick that in the ball of wool, will that make a jumper? What if I do the two balls of wool, will that make a jumper? No. What do I need to make make something? You need to make a chain first, and then you need to put the wool in and out, and in and out, and catch it, and then you might be able to make a nice little square. 
Look. Do you think that came from those three balls of wool? And the hook. But what else do you need to, to make it? You can pass that round so everybody can see. Pass it round. You need, you, want to, you need to put it together. You also need to have a pattern to show, to follow, to know what you're doing. And you need to tie them all in in a certain way so they stay together and make the shapes and make the, the pattern of a flower on it. Right, I've got something else here, right? So I want a couple of bigger children here. Skylar, take a block, right? Ayanna, I, you take a block, come up here. You sit down a wee minute, just sit down so everybody can see. Take a block, I want somebody out here, Latabo. Nana, Mom, up here, all got a block, there's a few blocks. Right, I just want some of the bigger ones to, to do in a wee second. If you don't mind, just a few bigger ones for now. A few of the bigger ones, just for a minute. Because I need you to think about what you're going to do. How many more have I got? Oh, three more. Three more. Okay, right. Now, who's got a block? If you've got a block, stand up. Sit, sit down. No, I have no one wee minute. If you've got a block, stand up. Right, with your block, what can you do with that one block? With one block? One block. What can you build with one block? Yes, I am. You break it down and... Uh, ah, but then that makes it into more than one block. You've got one block. What are we going to do with our one block? Can your one block become a fish? No. Right. What if I showed you a picture? Let me see if I can... Now, you have to sit back a bit or nobody will see. Oh, you just painting it. What? No painting, right? If I give you that picture and you build me a fish... Show me how you're going to do it. All those that have got a block. Your one is at the very top. If you've got a block, bring your block over here. No, bring it over. Who has the flower? Put it on top. Is it a flower? No. Let's wait and see. Can they make a fish out of the blocks? Do you think they can make it? Oh, thank you. Did you all see it? Here you go, David. Catch. <laughs> Do you think they're going to be able to make a fish out of the blocks? Oh, you sit down, darling. Right. Who has the other one? Oh, are we nearly there? Let's have a look at it now. Oh, does it look like a fish yet? We're missing. No, that's not the way. Shh. Where's the instructions? Who has the instructions? Have we any missing blocks anywhere? Over here. Vera, Vera, can we come over here with a minute? Right, for those that have the wee square, how do you think, do you think you could do it if I give you a stick and some wool? Right, have we got it yet? It doesn't have to look exactly like it, but if it could look like a fish. Right. You and do you want to come over and have a go and see? Can you help them? Can I help them? Yeah, one way. Said, do you need help, guys? No. I think you might need help. No. Yeah, David, do you want to see? Can you help? No, it's it's Shh. right, gentle. What do you? What is your favourite team sport? We got it. We got it. Oh wow! Now sit down. Let ev oh, put that. That's another wee thing on it. Yeah. Put it on top here. Yeah, you don't need that one. Yeah, that's okay. Look. Right, everybody sit down so they can all see. Yeah. That's a whale. So look, from all their blocks, they made a fish. Yeah, that's a whale. Right, well, it's a whale. Sorry. I thought that was a That's its water spout. <laughs> right, everybody sit down and we have a wee think about how we did that. So when we all have one block, we can't do a big lot with, just you sit down where you are, that's all, you just sit down there. When we have one block, we can't do an awful lot with our one block, can we? We need to work together to make it into something bigger and better, yeah? 
And to stick them all together, we need a bit of a plan, don't we? We need a pattern and we need instructions. And for us to be what God wants us to be, what do we need to do? Do we need to read our Bibles? Because that's where our plan is, isn't it? And that's where our pattern is on how we can all be put together like the blocks or like the wool to make something bigger and better. When God made us as one person, when he made Adam, what did he need to do next? A girl. He made Eve. He saw that Adam was lonely and he made Eve. He knew that we needed to be with other people. And that's what God wants us to do. So we've got a Bible verse here in Romans. Would you like to read it? Okay, come on up and read it. It's the one in pink. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we though may, we though may for, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So we have lots and lots of different parts to our body. So our fingers have a different job to our knees. Our ears have a different job to our nose. And our mouth has a different job to our stomach. We have lots of different parts to the body that all have different jobs, just like the Bible verse says in Romans, just like the family of God, we are all different parts of the family of God, and we all have different roles to play. But when we put them all together, we do what God wants us to do. He wants us to work together. He wants us to work in harmony with each other. He wants us to be a big team, doesn't he? And he wants us to do the things that he asks us to do. Go out into our community and spread his word. And what other community are we in at the moment? Is your church a community? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Our church is a community. So we should look after our church family. And as a church family, we should go out into the world, into the streets around us, and tell them all about Jesus. Because that's what he's asked us to do. If one voice goes out, it's a quieter voice. But if lots of voices go out, is it a little bit louder, isn't it? And if we work together as a team in the family of God, we will see how God can work so many much more miracles. Isn't that right? So when we went together as a team here, we had a wee bit of, a wee bit of discussions over whether which brick went where. But when we have God's instructions and we follow God's plan, we will do exactly what God wants. So we're going to close our eyes and say we prayer now. And we'll have to put them away in a wee minute. So let's close your eyes. Dear Jesus, we want to thank you for being with us this week. And we want to thank you for making us all individuals, but giving us your family to be here, Lord. Help us to be a good community of a church and a good church to the community. We love you, Jesus, and help us to be your team players. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So while we're in a wee minute before you go, we'll just sit down a wee second. The Adults are still in doing feet washing. Would you want to sing one wee song? And then we'll give you out your wee ages. So I think we could sing a wee song. What song would you like to sing? Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Where we go? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak. loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Okay. What? <laughs>
We have uh, returned now for this uh, very solemn and special uh, moment. Just going to have a very short prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, we can proceed now with uh, partaking of the symbols of communion. Lord, these are uh, this is a very important and significant moment in a uh, Christian's life, and Lord, we do understand that there's nothing magical about it, but deeply spiritual. And as we partake of the bread and the grape juice, we pray, Lord, that you'll prepare our hearts and our minds to do it in a dignified manner and to acknowledge that which you did for us on our behalf. We thank you again for your presence here in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, we are going to have, I'm going to have the whole reading at once, and then we are going to kneel for the prayer of blessing upon the bread. We'll partake of the bread together, and then we'll again have the prayer for the wine, and we'll partake of the wine together, all right? So they're not going to be two separate readings. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is usually the passage that we use, and um, from the second part of verse 23, the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, and I find this significant that it's mentioned on the night that he was betrayed, to some extent every single one of us have betrayed Christ this past quarter, and we need, we need to take responsibility of that, for that. Uh, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For us, these are very easy to understand words. Try to put yourself in the shoes, in the sandals of the disciples on that night. What is he talking about? And by faith, they partook of this. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And I love verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, in our reality, someone who's died will never come back. But this is God's reality, and we all worship a God who is alive. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite the deaconesses to just uncover the table. And for those who are able, I would like to invite you to kneel together with us. If not, you can just remain seated and we'll have the blessing upon the bread. Let us pray. Our great God in heaven, we'd like to give thanks for this privilege to partake the commemoration of your sacrifices in your life that was set before us. I'd like to thank you for the life that you have given us. Through your death, we have a second chance to live. Through your forgiveness, we have the salvation that we can attain. We thank you for your love, that great love towards us. As we partake the bread, Father, we remember the death that, you, that had happened a long time ago, but you lived again. Father, we thank you for this. Bless us. And always, always remind us, Father, that your sacrifices should not fail, that we should do our part. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
So um, I would like to invite those who will be partaking to stand. I'm, I'm not sure, I've never been here, I don't know exactly how you do it, but if you don't mind, just for today. <laughs> so those who are partaking to stand, it will be easier for the uh, uh, deacons to see who, will, who is partaking and who is not. And also, uh, again, I'm sorry to do this, but for those who are going to serve um, gluten-free, uh, to just raise your hand as well. So you'll have to stand and raise your hand, and then our deacons will be able to, uh, to identify you, all right? Is that okay? So I invite you to stand, those who are partaking, and then the deacons will be coming to you. And we can have some beautiful music. For gluten-free, do we go upstairs as well? You can sit down. Has everybody been served? Okay. I invite you now to join me as we eat this bread together, remembering Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. Let us eat.
Once again, I would like to invite you, if you are able to, to kneel with us as um, we'll have the blessing upon the wine. Let us pray. Our God, which are in Father, we worship you that you are our God and you are close to us in every way. We thank you that you came in this world and died for us so we can all be together with you. We thank you that you shed your blood on the cross so we might be saved through your blood. We thank you that you love us so much and you want us to be saved. We are coming before your presence now to thank you for this and we thank you that through your sacrifice everyone in here can be saved. We are clinging to your promises and to your blessings and please be with us, help us in our walks of life, transform us through your Holy Spirit so we can all be true representative for you, of you in this earth. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I would like to invite those who will be partaking to stand as the deacons are going to come to you with uh, the grape juice. And as soon as you've taken the glass, you may see it. Has everybody been served? I'd like to invite you now to uh, rust the drink together, this uh, grape juice that symbolizes Christ's blood who washed away our sins. Let us drink together.
I invite all to stand up so we can sing our closing hymn, hymn uh, 223, crown him with many crowns. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this moment that we've had together here in your church. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your sacrifice. And dear Lord, allow us to understand what that means, what it truly means, and help us, Lord, to be equipped and ready to go into the village and make you known to the people. And now, dear Lord, as we're about to separate May the love of God, our Heavenly Father, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the companionship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.